Hello, good day. My name is Bethan Davis and I'm a lecturer in geography here at Royal Holloway Department of Geography and I'm an expert in glaciers and climate change and so I want to talk to you today about glaciation and how glaciers are important in terms of providing communities with water in downstream societies. Let's first think about how much ice is there in the world. We live in an ice age. We live in a world with two big ice sheets. There is the Antarctic ice sheet in the southern hemisphere and the Greenland ice sheet in the northern hemisphere. The Antarctic ice sheet would raise global sea levels by about 58 metres if it melted. The Greenland ice sheet would raise global sea levels by about 7 metres if it all melted. And then much, much smaller, covering only half a percent of the global land surface, are these glaciers. And in these maps, they're bright yellow. And global glaciers and ice caps would only raise global sea levels by about 41 centimetres. So they are the, uh, the, the little kid in the Ice Age system. If we go back 27,000 years to the global last glacier maximum, there was far more ice in the world. Uh, global sea levels were about 130 metres lower than today. So if you look at this map, you can see that the sea is different and the land is different. And there are lots of islands and land bridges that don't exist today. There were big ice sheets over Europe and North America that have since melted. So we had a, an ice sheet with 76 metres sea level equivalent over North America. So an ice sheet even bigger than the Antarctic ice sheet today. And a, a fairly small ice sheet with only 18 metres sea level equivalent over Northern Europe. Let's put this into the context of carbon dioxide and climate change. At the global last glacial maximum, carbon dioxide was about 185 parts per million. And we can actually see the carbon dioxide going back over the last 800,000 years from ice cores. And so we can see that the carbon dioxide has gone up and down and up and down in these fairly predictable cycles. But over the last 800,000 years, and in fact, we can go back several million years, carbon dioxide has always been below 300 parts per million in all the interglacials. In 1958, when observations began, global carbon dioxide was 315 parts per million. In 2018, there was a new record of 407. In 2019, a new record of 411 parts per million. This brings us into a carbon dioxide world that we haven't seen for, for several million years. It's likely that the 2020 carbon dioxide levels will again reach a new record, even with the slight reduction in emissions we saw during the global lockdown. It is likely that we'll still have another record or very close. So a change in carbon dioxide from 185 to 300 parts per million was enough to melt all those ice sheets and raise global sea levels by 130 metres. So what does another 100 or another 200 parts per million carbon dioxide mean? We can see that the temperatures have changed. We have here in the in these stripes, this is uh, global temperatures over the last 2000 years. And then we have these numerical models that can predict future climate. How will ice masses react to these future changes? The first thing we have to do is understand how they've reacted to these air temperatures we've seen over the last 2000 years. And then we can better understand their sensitivities and better predict future change. This is a glacier. It is a fairly simple thing. A glacier is simply a pile of ice. It's a pile of ice that moves down slope under its own weight. Glaciers are viscous fluids like, like oozy soft honey or tar, and they will fall and slide down slope under their own gravity. The ice itself will deform and, and move down slope. Glaciers live in cold places. They live in mountains and they will receive input from snow falling into their upper regions. And that snow will be transferred by this process of movement to the bottom of the ice where it will melt because it's warmer lower down. 
So glaciers are this system where they're constantly receiving snow from uh, precipitation, from snowfall, from windblown snow, from avalanches. Snow is falling onto the uppermost part of the glacier. It is moving down through the glacier and then it's melting at the bottom. So glaciers gain and lose mass. They gain mass in their upper parts in their accumulation zones and they lose mass in their lower parts in their ablation zones. So there's this constant transfer of mass. If you increase the amount of snow and the glacier receives more, more precipitation, the glacier will grow, it will get bigger. It will still be transferring mass from the top to bottom, but as it's receiving more mass, it will grow. If, on the other hand, the glacier starts to melt more, perhaps because it's got warmer, the glacier will shrink. It will still be moving and still be flowing down slope under its own gravity, but the glacier itself will be getting smaller and shrinking. Worldwide, most glaciers are shrinking. Almost all glaciers in the world today are shrinking. They are losing more mass every year than is being replenished by snowfall. You can see these maps here. We've mapped uh, the extent of the glaciers in different time periods. So we've got 1880, Little Ice Age, 1943, 1977, and 2006. And you can see in this, era, in this photograph, the glacier is getting smaller. In fact, globally, uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so, from 1961 to, to 2016, uh, we've lost 9.6 billion, 9,600 billion tonnes of ice. It's just such a big number. Uh, 9,600 billion tonnes of ice has been lost from glaciers alone, not even from Antarctica or Greenland, just from glaciers. 300 uh, and 60 gigatons will raise global sea levels by one, mil one millimeter. You can see that the Southern Andes, SAN, down at the bottom there, that's lost 1,200 billion tons. So it's had, over those 50 years, it's had quite a significant sea level contribution, as has Alaska, about 10 millimeters of sea level rise just from Alaska over those 50 years. These glaciers worldwide are all contributing significantly to sea level rise and they're all losing mass. Globally, the glacier mass budget is about 260 gigatons per year, so getting on for two thirds of a millimetre of sea level rise every year just from glaciers. That is the global mass loss. They are losing that much ice per year. This glacier recession is without precedent on a global scale. The we are seeing recession here that we have never observed before. Uh, in this graph with these funny red and blue lines, you can see that the glaciers uh, in every region of the world here are shown. Uh, some areas we have longer records for than others, but you can see all these different regions. If it's blue, the glaciers are growing, they're getting bigger. And if it's red, the glaciers are shrinking and getting smaller. So you can see that globally, Glaciers were largely getting bigger from 1550 right through to about 1880, when they reached their maximum. By about 1880 to 1900, most of these glaciers reached their maximum and no longer got any bigger. And then over the last 50 years or so, these glaciers have all been shrinking. And that rate of recession is accelerating. So if you just look at Alaska, you can see that glaciers are shrinking faster now and have reached a minimum extent. And in this mass balance curve, you can see that glacier mass, ba mass balance is increasingly negative. The cumulative mass balance is a strong downward trend. These glaciers are out of equilibrium with climate. They're not responding instantly to climate change. They, we, we, we could call them a, a smoother of climate change. They respond to longer term climates. And so these glaciers will continue to recede even if glaciers, even if climate change stops, even if we stop warming and we reach a global equilibrium of climate tomorrow, these glaciers will still continue to shrink. Glaciers melt, they produce water. And we can see that as the, the air temperatures increase in this black line in the bottom, as the air temperatures increase, the volume of ice will decrease. So the, the air gets warmer, the glacier shrinks, the volume of ice gets smaller. 
but glaciers can act as a store of water. So glaciers will release water to the downstream area and they'll often release it in, uh, in the dry season when there's not so much precipitation. So they can be significant contributors to downstream meltwater. As glaciers shrink and recede, the amount of meltwater will increase. So the amount of meltwater produced will get larger. So these glaciers will produce ever more meltwater. So it's a boom time. You can grow better crops. You can grow more rice. You can irrigate your fields. You can grow more avocados. It's great. The downside is that as your glaciers shrink, eventually they don't store so much water. They become so small, they no longer store much water. And these glaciers will therefore contribute smaller amounts of melt water to downstream communities. So we call this peak water. Peak water is that period of time where glaciers are producing the most melt water. After peak water is reached, the amount of melt water produced every year will decline. And eventually, if the glacier has gone completely, you will only have the, the, the water in the rivers from precipitation. If you have a very seasonal precipitation, then you will only have water in the wet season and you won't have that storage that's being slowly released. So we can think of glaciers, they're a great buffer to water shortages. The glaciers work really well for releasing the water slowly. They buffer dry years. Uh, they, uh, they can store that water up in, in very wet years and release it in dry years. When the glaciers are gone, they no longer provide that function. They don't store the water, they don't release it in the dry season, and we're much more likely to have droughts and water shortages. We can calculate when we will receive peak water using some fairly, some fairly simple numerical, semi, numerical models. We know how much volume of ice we have and we can estimate how much the ice is receding. We can see here that global meltwater has already been reached in many countries. So if this is a pixel for all the different countries, all the different glaciers, all the different areas with glaciers. If it's red, then peak water was reached in 1980 and glacier meltwater production has declined since. Uh, if it's orange, then it was reached in about 2010. If it's, if it's yellow, then it's around now, peak water, 20, over the next 10, over, now to, for the next 10 years. If it's green, it's in 2040. And then if it's blue or purple, then it's a long way in the future. Peak water will be around 2100. And what you can see here is that in many parts of the world, peak water has already been reached. The key issue is that around one third of the world's population lives in these catchments, depending on this water. So you've got all these different catchments here for all these different glaciers, and uh, they are very severely populated. And you can see that peak water has already been reached in many places. Peak water was reached um, in around 2010 uh, in many parts of South America. Peak water will be reached in around 2050 for the Aral Sea in this area. Uh, and peak water has already been reached in many parts of, of North America. These, gla these glaciers are therefore very vulnerable to glacier recession, and that means that our water supply is also vulnerable. So in this project that I was, I was involved with, we were calculating the water towers. We thought about mountains as water towers. Mountains generate water. They force air to rise up and then it condenses and it produces precipitation. So mountains are generators of water. And then that water is stored in the mountain, in the glaciers and in the lakes and in the snow. And then it's released in the dry season. So in this blue circle, we've calculated the amount of water supplied by each, by each mountain unit. And so we've got L, which is lakes, G, which is glaciers, S, which is snow, and P, which is precipitation. So there is generation of water from snow and precipitation, and then the storage of that water in lakes and glaciers. And you can see that some water towers are much more important than others. So some water towers are producing, some mountain regions are producing much more water than others and storing much more water than others. And then you can see in the orange and brown, this is the demand on these water towers. And again, you can see that some areas are demanding much more water from those water towers than others. So we have the demand from natural services, from forests and ecosystems and from the environment. 
Uh, D end is the demand from industry and hydropower. Uh, we have the domestic demand from cities. And then we have the irrigation, the demand from irrigation. And you can see that some places are demanding much more water than others. We calculated a water towers index for all of these different mountain regions, all these different water towers. So the water tower index is a function of the supply of water and the demand for water. And if the supply and the demand are about equal and it's about being met and it's very important, then it has a very high water tower index. It's all normalized to one. So every single water tower has been ranked from zero to one. And uh, at zero, there is probably either, either not much supply or not much demand. So it's not that important. And at one, there is a lot of supply and a lot of demand and it's therefore very important. And in this map, we've uh, labelled the five most important water towers. So you can see that in North America, we have the Pacific and Arctic, Arctic coasts and the Fraser, Columbia, Northwestern USA are very important water towers. And then in the South America, we've got the Negro, Southern Chile, Pacific coast. These are also very important water towers. And they're producing water that's being used in, in the east of these mountain regions where it's very dry in places like Argentina. Uh, then we have the uh, the Himalaya and the Himalaya, the global glacier volume is, is smaller. If you think back to those bubbles and that map I showed, the amount of ice being lost each year is less because the volume of ice is less than it is in Alaska or Patagonia. But it's really, really important because these water towers are producing water that is highly in demand from the downstream uh, societies. Globally, 1.9 billion people are living in these catchments. They're living in these catchments where they require water from these mountains and they're dependent on it for hydropower, for irrigation, for industry, for domestic consumption. Let's look at Patagonia in a little bit more detail. This is, Pat this is uh, South America and Patagonia is the southernmost part of South America. Currently, mass loss is in the South America is 19 billion tonnes of water every year, fairly insignificant in terms of sea level rise, but this is an important water tower. Peak meltwater has already been reached, and these basins are important for hydropower. The hydropower is, is very uh, uh, important for power generation in this part of the world. So we have increasing water risk because the glaciers have already reached peak meltwater, the amount of meltwater being produced by these glaciers is declining, and that means that the amount of meltwater available for hydropower is also declining. And if we look to the future, if we look under RCP 4.5, this is the uh, concentration pathway of carbon dioxide that we are largely following now, RCP 4.5. Uh, in Patagonia, we would have glacier volume reduction of 20 to 50%. By, 20, by 2100. So we would be, uh, the glaciers would be half the size in 2100. A lot of the glaciers will disappear. Uh, and there's a strong imbalance. The glaciers will continue to shrink uh, beyond 2100 because there won't be an equilibrium with climate. On the other hand, if we follow RCP uh, 2.6, which would allow us largely to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, we will keep most of the glaciers. So in this figure uh, on, on the right, uh, in red is RCP 8.5, which is the high end emission scenario. And then in blue, we have the RCP 2.6, which is the, the low end emission scenario. And you can see that if we follow RCP 2.6 in Patagonia, by 2100, we're keeping more like 80% of the glacier volume, which would be enough to sustain the hydropower and the irrigation demands from this water tower. So the water tower index in southern Chile has a water tower index rank of 0.64. It's the most important in the Americas and it's vulnerable. So here we have these little radar plots and they tell us about vulnerability. Vulnerability to changes in GDP and population, which would increase demand. Vulnerabilities to temperature and precipitation, DT and DP. Uh, so that would reduce the amount of water available by shrinking the glaciers. 
Then we have GE, which is government effectiveness, and we have a baseline water stress. And you can see that in southern South America, uh, changes in GDP, changes in precipitation are very important for uh, making these water towers very vulnerable. And that means that these water towers could well uh, be very threatened and the people demanding this water could be very threatened. Let's think about the Himalaya. The Himalaya, uh, smaller ice volume, but also changing very rapidly. In this figure, the red lines are the amount of glacier thinning that we've observed. The blue lines are increases in thickness and the red lines are decreases in glacier thickness. And across the Himalaya, glaciers are thinning and shrinking and getting smaller. And that's projected to continue. So here on all these four little graphs, we've got projected area change by 2050. Uh, and you can see that's just compared to 2014. So more or less the last, the last few years. Um, and you can see that we could be losing, the glaciers could be at sort of 40 to 60% of the current glacier volume. However, if we stick to 1.5 degrees centigrade, this, this figure here on the right, you've got the dashed line, that is the 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, warming scenario. So if we follow 1.5 degrees centigrade, by 2100, we'll be keeping more like 70 to 80% of global glacier volume. There are severe demands on water in the Himalaya. So these circles here, this is the amount of hydropower. The dark blue is the installed hydropower. The light blue is the potential hydropower. And you can see that there is, there is potential for more hydropower in these areas. And it's all coming from these glacierized catchments. And then on the other graph, we have irrigation. So we have the amount of uh, irrigation that is uh, developed in these areas. And again, this is all coming from the glacierized catchments. This is a hugely populous region. Uh, something like 235 million people live immediately in this area and they are immediately dependent on these waters. Um, so we've got the populations of people in this graph on the left and on the right, you've got the water tower index and you can see that it's, it's purple. So the Amu Daria, the Indus, the Tarim interior, these are very, very important water towers because there is a high volume of supply of water and a high volume of demand of water. And in fact, there's a water gap. So that water gap is being uh, filled by taking groundwater out the ground and that is unsustainable. So the water requires to close this gap is coming from unsustainable groundwater use. It was heavy irrigation, dense population and intense demand on these water towers. So not only are they very important, they are also very threatened. So here we have our radar plots again. You can see that these water towers that are the most important are also the most threatened. They're threatened due to poor government effectiveness. There is uh, these, these uh, transboundary basins with this hydropolitical tension among multiple countries. Uh, the population is projected to increase and the GDP is projected to increase, which of course is excellent news for local societies. Um, but that's going to increase demand on the water tower. And if we combine that with uh, local temperatures, which are expected to be very high, this is an area of the world that is warming more than average, then the glaciers are also projected to shrink. So we have increasing demand, but shrinking glaciers, which leads to increased water tension. This really highlights the importance of limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees centigrade. If we do that, the majority of the ice will remain. So here we have uh, RCP 2.6, which is in blue, versus RCP 8.5, which is red. So RCP 2.6 is largely aligned with the 1.5 degrees centigrade emissions pathway. This is the Paris Agreement that, we, that our government and other governments have signed up to. Uh, if we follow this uh, limit ceiling of 1.5 degrees centigrade, then global glacier loss will uh, not be too severe and we will retain enough water to sustain these societies. However, if we follow much more severe climate change uh, with this business as usual, high end emission scenarios, 
we would actually see the majority of the world's glaciers uh, being substantially smaller by 2100 with substantially less meltwater being produced and that would lead to water shortages uh, in these in, in these downstream catchments it would also lead to flooding in the, uh, in the due to higher sea levels um, but we're talking mostly about water resources in this talk how close are we to 1.5 degrees centigrade this graph shows a human induced warming up to 2020 uh, in 2017 we reached about one degree centigrade of warming and this green line here is the climate pathway for reaching 1.5 degrees centigrade so we hope to reach our, our peak temperature around 2050 uh, with a small overshoot and then come down again. Uh, the current warming rate shows that we will be reaching the limit of, uh, of 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2040. And then on the right, we have the carbon budget. So we have the CO2 emissions uh, uh, in gigatons of carbon dioxide. And the black line is the annual CO2 emissions that we have. And then all these coloured lines are these pathways that we need to follow. So you can see the pathways would be easier to follow if we'd already started making severe reductions to CO2. And the pathways are increasingly steep from now on. So if we uh, drastically reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we have now to reach net zero by around 2050, then we can feasibly meet this 1.5 degree centigrade warming scenario. The longer we leave it, the more challenging it will be to be on this 1.5 degree centigrade pathway. So the take home messages are that globally glaciers cover about 0.5% of global land mass. They're really quite small. They only have about 40 centimetres global sea level equivalent. Uh, but they're going undergoing unprecedented recession. They're losing billions, hundreds of billions of tonnes of ice every year. This is very closely related to increasing global temperatures. And they're important because glaciers provide water resources to 1.9 billion people. That's a third of the world's population. And these water resources are threatened as we increasingly reach meltwater in all the different parts of the world. And that means that the contribution of glaciers to downstream communities is decreasing or declining. Water stress is predicted to increase as demands increase and supply decreases, especially in the dry season, leading to more droughts and more water shortages. But if we follow a lower CO2 emissions pathway and stay within one and a half degrees centigrade of warming, we will avoid the worst impacts, ensure water security for millions of people. And CO2 must be reduced to net zero by 2015. I wanted to highlight some resources available. This is my website, antarcticglaciers.org. It is an online textbook. Uh, it has lots and lots of up-to-date, accessible, helpful information. Uh, uh, topics that are relevant to your A-level have been highlighted with a yellow flash, so you can easily find them. So there's articles here on mass balance and glacier flow. Uh, it was awarded a Certificate of Excellence in Geological Education just recently. And it's supported by people like the Royal Geographical Society, uh, the Geographical Association, Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, and, and numerous other organisations who have supported the website over the years. Um, and there's plenty of teaching resources available. Uh, please do come and explore the glaciation of Patagonia, Britain and Antarctica. Uh, just one example of a novel teaching resource is this uh, online map of the glaciation of Patagonia. So you can uh, open this up in your browser and view all the geomorphology uh, and you don't need to download ArcGIS or anything like that to do that. And there's plenty of resources that explain the glacial geology of Patagonia. There's new and coming resources on the British ice sheet and plenty of other resources. Thank you very much.